greeting to all of you and welcome to the University A Cappella Choir Concert. We're very delighted that you are here this evening, that you've chosen tonight to be with us instead of out on your patio grilling in 40 degrees. <laughs> now, some have suggested that it's our fault that you're having such cold weather. I don't know. Um, I'm not sure how that works exactly, but we were very fortunate that uh, yesterday, in our free day in San Antonio, we had upper 70s. And so the one day we most needed good weather, we got it. So thank you, Texas. We appreciate that. I have the distinct pleasure of introducing to you someone that is relatively new to Concordia University, although he's reminded me recently that I can't really introduce him as the new guy anymore since he's been there since August. But our president of Concordia University is with us tonight, and he is anxious to share with you some words about Concordia and some of the exciting things that are happening at Concordia University. So I'm going to ask President Bernard Bull to please come forward and speak to you. So he reminded me that I was supposed to do something before he talked, so ignore that introduction. That's, we'll try that again later. Uh, I've had the privilege over the course of this tour to give uh, kind of an update on music at Concordia. And uh, I always like to say good things about the music program, but this year in particular we are very excited because on the campus of Concordia, music is about to have the newest building. If you look on page 18 in your concert program, you'll see an architectural rendering of what that building is going to look like in the future. And the future is getting closer and closer. In fact, as of this last week, the final concrete precast forms went up on all four sides of the building. So the place actually looks sort of similar to that drawing right now. There's still a lot of work to be done yet. The inside is still kind of a shell, and they're going to renovate the old portion of the building as well. But the reason we're excited about this building is, number one, for the first time since 1966, our music building will have an elevator. It is a huge blessing for a music building to have an elevator. When you have timpani on the third floor and you have choir risers in the basement storage, you're trying to get these up and down stairs, we are going to not only increase the safety for students schlepping equipment all over the building, but for the first time the building will be accessible to all people. And we are really very excited about that. In addition to that, the plan to, to increase and to um, improve the facility led to a more grandiose plan than we could have imagined. We really wanted an elevator, and the Lord said, no, it's time for music to have much more than that. And so now we have an orchestra and band room that is about 40% larger than the previous room, a choir room that's about 25% larger than the previous room. We have classrooms and offices, Steinway Piano Studios in the basement. Uh, we have a black box theater for drama, and we also have for the first time ever, a state-of-the-art recording studio. The old portion of the building, if some of you have been on campus in the past, you remember in 1966 that that building went, uh, was constructed. The old building has been completely gutted and is going to have new walls, new ceilings, new floors. And one of the reasons for this was because the, the former building had a lot of issues with acoustics. Things weren't quite right. They did the best they could in the early 60s, but now we know a lot more about acoustics and the engineering behind it. And so all of our practice rooms now will be isolated from other practice rooms. It used to be if you were singing in one room, you could hear the saxophone next to you clear as day, and the two seldom match together very well. Uh, so that problem is rectified. Um, also, hearing safety is a big issue now that we didn't know much about. 
maybe back then, and so the orchestra and band director will be able to conduct rehearsals without earplugs. And earplugs aren't great when you're trying to listen critically to a group rehearsing. Uh, so um, there, there are many things about it that, that we are very, very excited about. It is in process. It's not done. We don't expect to have occupancy of the building until probably late October, so the middle of first sem semester of next year. So there's still opportunity for you to pray for us, and if you have a heart for music at Concordia and you'd like to donate to the, pro to the uh, project, you, you are still, uh, there's still a possibility that you could do that as well. So, um, in addition to that, the music program at Concordia is alive and well and thriving, even though we've been displaced for the last year because of the building program and the year before that because of the pandemic. Uh, the a cappella choir, for instance, has rehearsed on the lawn, in a gymnasium, in auditorium seating, in a classroom, in a church balcony. I think we figured out we've been in seven or eight different places for rehearsal in the last two years. We've not been in a bona fide rehearsal space for choirs in, in so long, and we are really excited to, to get back to that. Um, but we have currently about 65 music majors, which makes us the largest music program in the Concordia University system. We have about uh, 250, 275 students who are participating in one or more of our 14 ensembles. Uh, we offer degrees in music education, church music, music therapy, and a BA in music, which can lead to performance. It can lead to uh, advanced degrees in conducting, music theory, uh, and composition, and a whole host of other things. We also have a lot of Texans that come up to Concordia for music. Um, I know you got a lot of colleges in this state, but there's a bunch of students that decide they got to go north and up to, up to the great state of Nebraska, and we would love to keep that pipeline going. In fact, if you look in the program, I think there are six or seven a cappella members uh, who are from Texas. Um, so we're, we're real proud of our Texans when they come up, and um, they're terrific singers like, like all the kids in the choir. So without further ado, now it is my pleasure to introduce to you <laughs> my president, Dr. Bernard Volk. Now it's your turn. <laughs> Good evening. I have the distinct honor of serving as the 13th president at Concordia University, Nebraska. And it's a joy to spend this evening with all of you as we celebrate and are enriched by the gift of music combined with God's life-giving word. I want to offer a special word of thanks to God's people at St. Paul Lutheran Church for being such wonderful, gracious hosts, and for all of you for joining us here tonight. Concordia University, Nebraska is a thriving Lutheran and Christ-centered university focused on excellence, and Christ-centered is a critical part of what we mean by excellence. We have the joy of witnessing one expression of that excellence here with the gifts of music and hard work and discipline and everything that went in to what we're experiencing here tonight. I also want to share that Concordia is not just another college or university. We are proudly and distinctly Lutheran and Christian in what we do, and in some ways that is a radical notion in today's world. Salvation by grace through faith in Christ is radical in our culture in a world that strives for identity, purpose, meaning, value, worth, and acceptance in all sorts of ways. Concordia is a community that proclaims that all such pursuits are ultimately in, in vain, but answers are revealed at the foot of the cross. Consider these words from Galatians chapter 2. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Far from an abstract concept, this is a truth that transforms what we do, how we do it, and why we do it at Concordia. God's word does not conform to the patterns of this world. Our call to love our neighbors, our enemies, and those who persecute us runs counter to the sinful nature that so often compels us inward. I'd like to share briefly my story of Lutheran education. I attended public schools going up to about sixth grade. I was riding the bus living in Alton, Illinois at the time. I was riding the bus to school and I felt something cold on my neck. It was a knife. A young man behind me threatened to take my life. 
I spent the day in the bathroom a bit ill and nervous about what was to come on the bus ride home. The principal called, found out, and called my family and brought us in and ultimately said, we don't think we can keep your son safe here. We think you should send him somewhere else. And so that's how I ended up in a Lutheran school. I went to a Lutheran school that year to save my life. Little did I know that I would be hearing from God's life-giving word as well that would be quite transformational for me. During that one semester in a Lutheran school, a pastor who was teaching the day school confirmation class, Reverend, uh, now sainted Reverend Herb Mueller, was teaching about the love of God in Jesus Christ. And I remember vividly one particular day, it was, he was trying to hit home the notion that God loves us collectively and each of us individually. And he talked about, do you think that God would have sent his son to die for us if there were only a thousand people on the earth? If there were only a hundred people? What if it were only you? And he indicated in, in the affirmative that God does indeed love each and every one of us. And that stuck with me as God's word was planted in me. That was significant. Little did I know how significant. It was that one semester that I lived, that I attended Zion Lutheran School in Bethalto, Illinois. After that, my father came home and said, hey everyone, we're moving again. We moved a lot as a kid. And we moved just 230 miles south of here to Laredo, Texas. This is the first time I've ever shared this story in Texas, actually. And we were there, and in the first week, in the middle of the night, my mother woke me up and said, uh, honey, we have to go to the hospital. Your father is sick. And on that night, I witnessed my father dying of a massive heart attack. And as I'm sitting in the back room, grieving, hearing my mother make the phone calls to family members and others, you know what came to mind? All of those words that were planted in me that one semester. I remember vividly thinking, your father is gone, but you have a father who will never be gone. I remember the words of Jesus, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'm with you always to the very end of the age. God's word planted in me became a rock, a source of strength and comfort, and ultimately a sense of purpose and calling that led me to serve in Lutheran education. That's the work that we're doing at Concordia. If one semester can make that much of a difference in the life of a young person, Imagine what happens if we commit to, uh, to years of faith formation and catechesis in the Lutheran education system all the way up through a higher education system like Concordia University, Nebraska. In the book of Acts, we have the stoning of Stephen, what's often referred to as the first Christian martyr, and he's having rocks thrown on him. His life is fading away rapidly. What comes out of his mouth? Think of what come, came out of your mouth the last time a rock landed on your foot let alone something like this. The things that come out are often that which is planted in us. And so what came out of Stephen that day is he said, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And then he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. You may recall those are words quite similar to the words of Jesus on the cross because he was emulating the words of his Savior in that moment because that is what had been nurtured in him through faith formation, those who shared God's word with him for such a time as that, for that moment. None of us know the moments in our future, but I believe that the Concordia University system is a critical part of equipping people for the joys, the challenges, the opportunities of the future, wherever God might call them. We strive to equip people with a solid foundation and a collection of friends and mentors that will be with them for a lifetime. And as they face those unexpected joys and challenges, we pray that God will equip them for that moment. You can count on Concordia to boldly proclaim Jesus as we prepare students for lives of service, learning, and leadership in the church and in the world. We'll get back to our concert here in just a moment, but I do have three asks of you tonight. First, I ask that you keep Concordia and the Concordia community in your prayers. Second, 70% of our students say that they heard about us from someone they know. So please encourage students you know who would benefit from a Christ-centered Lutheran higher education to look at Concordia. Even just ask them to consider putting it in their top three. And if we can get them to visit campus, we have a pretty good chance at closing the deal. It's a special place. And third, if you're so inclined, we had the offering that was, that was just passed around, um, if you're so inclined, we ask that you consider supporting Concordia. If you want to refer a student, by the way, there's, you can even do that on the website. You can go to cune.edu slash refer, 
And if you are inclined to give, you can do the same thing. It's just cune.edu slash giving. Again, I thank you for spending this evening with us. Enjoy the rest of the concert.
We are very blessed to have performing with us on piano Dr. Elizabeth Grimpo, professor of music. She's been at Concordia for 14 years and heads up the piano department, also teaches oral skills and music appreciation. And we just feel as a choir very blessed to have someone of her, col um, her caliber um, collaborating with us in making this beautiful choral music. Now Dr. Grimpo will play Be Still My Soul.
This past summer, I asked Dr. Grimpo if she could do a little bit of research and find some music, some choral music with some significant piano parts. And she found about four or five selections and gave them to me, and of those, I chose the two that you see in your program and entitled this section, Two 19th Century Poems. And the poems by Tennyson and Longfellow are quite well known, but I don't believe the music is as much known. In fact, we couldn't find any recordings of this music anywhere, a problem that we hope to rectify in the week after we return back to Concordia. We want to get these recorded. And these songs are very beautiful. They sound of a time, but they also have a great deal of uh, very interesting uh, musical moments in them. And I would challenge you as you're listening to follow along in the program and read the words and think about how these poets have used the, the piano and the choral music to bring the text to life. There's a lot of text painting um, in both of these, these pieces, and it's kind of an enjoyable experience as you're hearing it to think about how these composers have done that. So this is two 19th century poems.
Before we sing our final selection, I would like to see if there are any alumni in the audience tonight of Concordia, Nebraska. Maybe it was called Seward, Concordia Teachers College. Wow, quite a few. Um, keep your hands up if you were a member. Well, I haven't told you what for yet. Yeah. If you were a member of the a cappella choir, keep your hands up. If you know the song, Ean, So Lord Jesus, Quickly Come, or could read it if I gave you music, keep your hands up. Okay, that's a, that's a good number. I think we're going to add an alternate piece in the program right now. Is there anybody else in the audience that went to a, a college and sang in a college choir? Anybody? Do you know Ean So Lord Jesus Quickly Come? Well, you're welcome to come up too and sing it with us. Let's, let's have everybody that knows Ean So Lord Jesus Quickly Come, quickly come forward and join the a cappella choir, and we'll have a mass old thing going on here.
and a pedigree. When I think of what my God can do, He doesn't ever change. 